Hey everyone, welcome to the Watson Blocks Podcast. This show is brought to you by Giga Energy, a leading electrical manufacturer focused on Bitcoin mining. And before we get too deep into the intro today, I wanted to quickly ask you guys for a huge favor. If you have not subscribed to the show or given us a rating and review, if you could take a second and go do that right now, that would be hugely helpful. And also, while you're at it, go check out our brand new YouTube channel that we launched. You can now watch all of these conversations as well as see some of the new content that we're going to be releasing soon. This week on the show, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Greg Beard, the CEO at Stronghold Digital Mining. This was one of those episodes that I have been a huge admirer of the business model at Stronghold Digital of being a truly vertically integrated Bitcoin miner. And so for me, this was a ton of fun to go deep on how all of that works. Greg gets really technical for us on the reclamation process and not only what the benefits of that are and how that's allowing communities to reclaim huge swaths of land, but also how that ash is being leveraged for carbon capture projects. This is one of those episodes that highlights exactly how Bitcoin mining is a bolt-on to an existing electrical producer, which I'm a firm believer that this type of business model going forward is going to be what the future of Bitcoin mining will look like. And so with that, I hope that you enjoy today's discussion with Greg Beard. This show is brought to you by Foreman, the official miner management software of the Watson Blocks podcast. Foreman is the leader in Bitcoin miner management software. Guys, this software suite is absolutely incredible. Not only can you automate your curtailment program, and cost avoidance, which yes, those are two different strategies, but you can also manage all of your inventory from one clean dashboard. Whether you're trying to avoid peaks or executing a block strategy or needing to manage three to infinity miners, Foreman can handle all of this for you. They are the software stack that will scale up with your operation as you continue to add more megawatts and complexity to your power strategy. Seriously, guys, the best way to get a full understanding of the capabilities of Foreman is to head over to their website right now, sign up today, because it's free up to 25 miners. Seriously, you didn't hear that wrong. It's absolutely free up to 25 miners. Go get signed up today and get started managing your miner fleet like the pros today at foreman.mn. That's F-O-R-E-M-A-N dot M-N. Foreman.ma. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Like I said in the introduction, I am super excited to be sitting down today with Greg Beard, the CEO of Stronghold Digital Mining. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to talk to you. Thanks, Ben. I, I Saying I'm excited is a little bit of an understatement, Greg. It's you know, we were we were just chatting a little bit offline before we hit the record button about, you know, if if people and I myself and one of those people are interested in like the overlap of power and Bitcoin mining, um, you stronghold digital are like the poster child for that. So this is going to be a fantastic conversation. I, I'm going to try and hold back my excitement. <laughs> I had fun to talk about and you're I think you already know a bit of the punchline, which is. Bitcoin mining is really power price arbitrage. Um, your inputs are our power, um, and your the efficiency of your miner is another big factor, and that determines how many coins you will make in a month. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're going to get into because you guys actually go deeper than just like power as the input. You guys actually have raw material input. To, to produce your power to produce the Bitcoin. So we're, we're going to get into all that. I don't want to, I don't want to jump ahead because I, with all my guests, I really like to hear your background because I think it, it lends nicely to helping us understand like just the level of expertise that you bring to the conversation. And so I'd love to hear your background and, and then I'd, I'd really like to hear how that and how you transition to Bitcoin mining and what you're doing today. Sure. So my, my background is really as a private equity investor in the energy space. So I've spent more than 25 years uh, investing in energy 
oil and gas, power businesses, energy services related businesses. And uh, the last 10 years before Stronghold was leading the energy business at Apollo. Mm. And I spent 10 years at Riverstone before that, uh, which is a Car- was a Carlisle affiliate investing in private deals in energy. And I started in the early 90s at Goldman Sachs in the energy group, which is how uh, I ended up in this business in energy investing. Stronghold came about through friendship. So one of my CEOs from my Riverstone days, I've kept in touch with, his name is Bill Spence, and he ended up owning the our first power asset, which is Stronghold. And I'd left Apollo and Bill and I you know, talk regularly. And he convinced me that this would be a very interesting business to get involved in. And, uh, you know, relating Bitcoin to um, power assets and really my view of, of Bitcoin mining being a really a derivative of, of power pricing arbitrage. Um, and so with a lot of, you know, modeling and study um, determined that this was a, you know, worthy enterprise. We did a couple of private round financings and went, went public in um, October of 2021. But I would say my my introduction to Bitcoin, and I know you probably have many listeners and viewers that are, you know, sort of Bitcoin fanatics yeah. going back, you know, 10 years. And, uh, you know, I'm newer to the the business and understanding, but still enthusiastic about it. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, so so Bill calls you up and says, you know, hey, hey, Greg, I think you should come take a look at this. And so was the asset that he owned, I mean, was he dabbling or or trying Bitcoin mining at the asset? Like maybe just like double click on that a little bit more. Like what what was the origin before Bill called you? Yeah, so um, the the power plant Scrubgrass, which is in Western Pennsylvania, Bill got involved there because he's, he spent 40 years of his career cleaning up uh, waste coal sites mm. across Pennsylvania and delivering that waste to plants like, like scrubgrass. And so his uh, through that activity, he ended up being very familiar with scrubgrass and ended up uh, as the owner of that business. And Bill's introduction to Bitcoin came through other Bitcoin miners that wanted to set up shop and buy power from us at at the plant and so the you know really the discipline was hey well should we sell power to these guys and what are the economics of that business and really through that that study and understanding what they were doing and what their business model was led us to determine that hey if bitcoin mining goes well yeah they they those customers would would pay us for the power if it goes poorly they wouldn't um but the returns for us being the miner, um, we had a lot more upside potential and the same downside risk. So we determined that the best thing to do was was instead of selling power to others that were mining, it would be more beneficial to just mine ourselves, which is what we ultimately decided to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I mean, and I appreciate you going a little deeper on that because... <sighs> I mean, anyone that models out a Bitcoin mining business would tell you the same thing, that it it's going to make the most sense to own the generation asset. But here you guys are, I mean, just one, two years ago, I think you were the only vert, like truly vertically integrated mining company. Um, I actually, I, I was thinking about this before we hit record too. I think HUD 8 with their announcement to to own uh, some of the Validus power up in Canada is there anyone else doing this, like the the operation, the way that you guys are? Yeah, I think Greenwich may be the only one, other one that owns a power plant, like outright. Um, but they unfortunately own it in you know my home state of New York, which is not a business friendly state, unfortunately. So I think they've their operations and expansions will be you know elsewhere, most likely. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, but I, um, I, I would say I. I from my vantage point, being vertically integrated is very helpful because it it should lead us to have the lowest cost of power. But I'll tell you that those that have performed the best in the in the public markets, um, 
aren't vertically integrated. They, they buy power from third parties. They don't own their data centers. They, they you know, rent those. Um, and so those guys are very capital light, except they own a lot of, you know, Bitcoin mining machines. Um, and that's allowed them to grow probably hash rate more quickly. But I think from my perspective, hey, that has worked for them. But it is a, a riskier strategy, given that, hey, if, you're, if your only assets are really rapidly depreciating Bitcoin mining machines. Yeah. Um, and you don't have the lowest cost of power, uh, like in theory, like on paper modeled out, we will survive a downturn um, when others won't because our power prices are cheaper. Um, but I think the, the retail, the average retail investor probably, you know, and apparently cares more about growth rate than it does about survivability and overall economics, um, which is you know, part of what we've offered is the notion that, hey, if the power, if power prices spike, which they frequently do, yep. we can shut our data centers down and deliver reliable power to the grid and make more money potentially than we would have made mining Bitcoin. And the inverse is true that, hey, if power prices collapse, we should and, and power prices end up lower than our cost to make the power. We should be able to buy power for less than it, it costs us to make it. And so we have a, a multiple way arbitrage, yeah. which it seems like other big miners, they sort of have a one way switch. If, if they have a, a power purchase agreement with a good price in it, they will run the miners. Um, and once that expires, they'll be resetting that. And I think things will look a little tougher for them when they when things are reset. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think so far, hey, the, the biggest winners in the space haven't been vertically integrated. And it's worked for them from a, a stock vantage point. Um, so I have to you know, acknowledge that, hey, while I, I think on paper we have the best model, it hasn't been the most enthusiastically received, um, maybe because the messaging has been right or we, we haven't started with, the, with enough scale. But um, I think from my vantage point, we will see more vertical integration on a go forward basis because a, the power component of this business is the most essential component. Yeah, it's the foundation. You know, it's uh, I mean, without a doubt, that is the the bedrock for which your your mining operation sits upon. So I, I think you're spot on, Greg. Um, it's it's interesting because it's almost like an inverse strategy for most of the miners out there that don't own the generation you know they uh, you look at like you know just like a riot for example where they've got you know power hedging and and like a power hedging strategy in place where you know they they end up turning off and then they can sell that power back but you guys get to control that so it's it's you guys wait for power prices to go up to divert the electricity so it's I, I really, I'm fascinated by it. And I don't want to like glaze by, you know, maybe laying out the whole business model. And and you kind of did just there, but like stronghold, maybe touch on like, just go a little bit more on what the, 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 the full business model for stronghold is and, and how you guys are operating. Yeah. And then we'll kind of, we'll go deeper in the, into that. Oh, sure. So hey, we're the, the purpose of the plants when they were built, so these, they're, I guess even going back further than that, and I'm going to use the C word, which unfortunately in this case is the word coal. So <laughs> we're cleaning up a hundred years of waste that resulted in um, in coal that was not good enough to be converted to um, power because it was too low in BTU or, or had other contaminants in it, and it wasn't good enough to u- be used to make steel. So about 40% of the material that comes out, that came out of the ground, you know, for the hundred plus years before 1975, mm-hmm. that was left on the surface close to the mine mouth. And that amounts to literally billions of tons of waste material that was once beneath the earth, below, below the water table that is now sitting on top, you know, which gets rained on. Um, it emits greenhouse gases and other contaminants just sitting there 
I think there's something like 840 of these piles. It's literally, you know, hundreds of millions or even billions of tons of this waste. Eight, and so sorry, eight, 800 different piles, 840 piles. That's, that's actually, you could, sorry you could to interrupt. It. That's, that's mind blowing. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, and it's all, it's, it's where you would expect them to be littered across mostly Pennsylvania, a little bit West Virginia. So this is a, a from my vantage point, a, this is, this is the coal that allowed us to build all these buildings in New York city, Chicago, like the East coast. Um, this is the coal that was used to build all of the, you know, our, the, the war machine of the United States that won world war two. Like this is not, yep. this was a, a big part, like cheap energy and steel is a big part of our nation's history. It all came from this uh, geography. Um, and unfortunately, hey, there was a lot of waste that came out of the ground as a part of it. And it's low B2 material. It's the thermal coal plants aren't designed to burn it. Like it, it'll just smolder, it won't burn. Um, and it's not met coal. It can't, you can't use it to make steel. It's sort of the, it's not good enough, right? So it's, this is truly a waste material. But the problem in this leaving it on the surface is that these 840 piles, like more than like about 50 of these piles are currently on fire. Oh my. And when I, if pile like this is on fire, you know, you can see, you know, there are pictures of it available. It's, that's, that's a waste burning without emissions controls, which I mean, all the sulfur in it ends up in the air all the mercury, all the cancer causing agents that are in that stuff end up in our environment with no emissions controls. And, you know, that, that, that is a, a massive problem. Further, when it rains, um, these piles aren't covered by, you know, they're, I, they're called piles. And when I think about a pile, I think about like, Hey, a, a small pile of leaves, the size of your, you know, bedroom. That's not it. These are mountains. So you're not going to cover them up with a tarp. You're not going to put them in a, in a, you know, landfill. They're too no, big. You can't. Yeah. Um, so to, to the, the, the most economic and the most environmentally friendly way to, to reclaim this land and clean up these piles is to use excavators and bulldozers and take this waste to one of about a dozen reclamation facilities like what Stronghold owns. And, you know, we partner with the DEC um, to identify like the worst emitting, most troublesome piles and we, we clean them up. Um, and because our, our technology at the plants is not a thermal coal plant, it's a, a circulating fluidized bed that was designed to burn this waste, um, we can get it to uh, combust. And we do that just by essentially suspending the waste material in a you know vortice in a vortex instead of having it sit sort of at the bottom of a boiler you know okay. a high btu material would burn a low b2 material like this will just smolder and so you yeah. have to suspend it to burn it um the oh, i guess just just going on with the environmental damage it, it's something like five thousand miles of waterways are ruined so you'll see pictures of you know, streams running red. And that is essentially the equivalent of battery acid, you know, which is obviously not fish don't do well in that environment. No, no, it, no. it looks like a, you know, what you would expect coming out of, you know, um, Russia or China. You know, it's like, okay, what places don't have environmental controls that let this happen? You wouldn't think it was right here, but it's, it's, uh, it's here. And we just haven't cleaned it up yet. Um, there are those though, that, that I would say, Unfortunately, um, we have been, you know, we are burning a, a waste uh, related to coal mining. Um, yeah. In doing so, we do put carbon emissions into the air. But a couple of recent studies, and I put links on the Stronghold website, uh, those studies demonstrate that by cleaning up the piles, that we're we're doing what's essentially a carbon negative activity, and the reason, the primary reason sure. for that, is that these piles emit um, <clears throat> methane, in addition to sulfur and the benzene and all the nasty stuff, 
and methane is much, much worse for the environment as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And so our process ends up being carbon neutral from a greenhouse gas standpoint as well. Um, hey, but there are some, you know, hey, there are a few groups out there that are so, uh, you know, I would say not not pragmatic or, or religious about not, quote, putting any new carbon in the air, that they they would rather that we not, you know, perform this reclamation. But I think I think the these new these pretty recent studies show that hey even they should be happy with the net greenhouse gas reduction that our activity yeah. um, provides for the environment in addition to what we do for the land because you can't this stuff is you don't want to have one of these piles in your backyard well and you can't you know, build on top of it either I mean yeah you can't it's uninhabitable yeah and it's it's dangerous from an emission standpoint and it you know they catch on fire as we talked about. It's just really, you know, so the primary business of these communities is gone. Like they're, these are mining towns and the mining jobs are finished. They're, they're, they're home. They're gone. And what's been left behind, Hey, thanks for the 30 years of your effort, you know, community for mining and benefiting the country. We're just going to leave you this smoldering waste pile, you know, for you to breathe and look at, uh, and sorry about your water that's contaminated. It's just really awful what wow. has been yeah. left behind. And yeah. so I, I'm passionate about it. We're, we're really a reclamation business. Our byproduct is power and the best use for that power and what helps the grid and what helps makes this activity go on is these Bitcoin mining data centers. So I think it's a, uh, you know, those that do it, a, you know, most people that live in Pennsylvania, they might drive past one of these piles on the way to work or school. It's, this is not a an unknown Jeez, secret yeah. out you know uh, in the state, which is why hey, it was a bipartisan effort to to put incentives in to build these things in the first place. But unfortunately, we're only plans. halfway done cleaning them up. You know, so they've been around yeah. for about thirty years, and we've gotten rid of a lot of this waste, but we still have another about fifteen years to go. Wow, and, I know uh, that was a lot. For one, yeah, for one yeah, question, yeah. but that's, that's the. <laughs> I well, I I appreciate you going into all of that, and I, I mean, you know, I'm I'm up in Minnesota. I you you heard me interrupt you to clarify 840 piles, and like you said, it's not a pile; it's a mountain. I mean, it's we're talking uh, just to like put a an actual scale on it. It's like dozens of football fields wide and long and deep. I mean, this is it's just it's tons and tons. It's so, I, I mean, I had never even really heard of the scope and scale of that. And, you know, I mean, it's incredible. Um, and what I like the most is that you guys start from the reclamation process, first and foremost. Like that was, like you said, that's what Bill was doing. He called you. You guys evaluated what the best use for the the reclamation process and the electricity generated. Sometimes it's Bitcoin mining. Sometimes it's energy to the grid. Um, so, I... I I, th I think it's incredible. I, um, yeah, you, you mentioned it briefly. I don't know why some groups really go out of their way to attack something that you're removing more harm than what you're, and we have to create energy. You have to create the electricity. So I'm not sure why, why those groups, you know, go after that. I think they, it's an effective fundraising pitch. They're, they're arguing, hey, look at these guys burning coal. It's like, well, guys, it's not coal. If it were coal, it would have already been burned. This is a waste. And many of these piles have been there for 100 years. So, hey, if there's something to do to clean it up, let's get it cleaned up. Um, yeah. I, as some have argued, hey, why don't you, we'll, we'll sprinkle some, you know, beach grass seed on top of it and then pretend it's not there. Like we remediate many piles that were, quote, remediated by this other strategy but it, it doesn't do anything for the water. It's still there. And like the only way to handle this is to clean it up. And it's a carbon negative activity. So, and unfortunately, people have, have, have spun a story that they've been able to fundraise around, which I think, unfortunately, for a lot of these environmental groups, a fundraising is a, is a primary goal. And a, what resonates with the public is, hey, we'll shut this coal burning guy down. It's like, well, yeah. That's not really what's going on, but if it's helping you raise money, I guess that's why you're saying this stuff. 
And now a quick word from our sponsor. This show is powered by Giga Energy. Giga Energy is a vertically integrated Bitcoin mining company that manufactures all of the electrical infrastructure needed to start mining Bitcoin. Whether that's medium voltage switchgear, PDUs, or power cables for your miners, the team at Giga Energy has you covered. Reach out to their sales team today for all of your electrical infrastructure needs at sales at gigaenergy.com. Use the word hash rate for the subject of the email and you'll get 5% off your order. All right, now back to the show. Yeah, it's too bad. It's uh, it, it's it's too bad. I So Greg, would you mind if I actually asked you a little bit more about the process? Um, and we'll link to it in the show notes. You guys have, it's it's a phenomenal video that actually shows and animates the the actual process. But could you just touch on one more time? Because I'm fascinated by like the the actual process to convert the coal or well, the waste coal rather into the electricity so you maybe starting from like how it gets fed into the you said it's suspended so like maybe go yeah. maybe go so into like have, how that actually works <laughs> sure and and probably the the best you know my favorite my favorite description which is i've i've got three kids and so there, there's actually a YouTuber named Mark Rober mm. who has a channel uh, that describes a lot of like science and engineering. He has an, he has an episode um, about a, a technology that's a fluidized bed. And what he does, he, he, he takes a, a hot tub, fills it with sand, but in, underneath all the sand are, are pipes that allow uh, air to flow through the sand. And in doing so, the sand goes from being solid, like sand on a beach, to being yeah. liquefied. So where if you were to jump in it, it it um it's more like quicksand where it, it you can okay. uh you can it'll flow. And so what we're doing is taking what is that's that same fluidized bed technology, which is the the trick here. Um we're taking what would be a solid, this waste coal, and through uh this put pumping air through it in a very sophisticated way, which is called this fluidized bed. That's making this solid flow like a liquid. And if it flows like a liquid and yeah. is suspended, uh, that's what's allowing it to combust. Because that, I think, as I said, if it's not getting, if it's just sitting on the bottom, the BTU is too low. Yeah. And it might smolder, but it's not really going to burn. Um, and so we're, t- we're taking, you know, just imagine if you're starting at the reclamation site, we, yep. you'll, you know, you we're using front end loaders, excavators, bulldozers, and ultimate dump trucks to haul this material, to gather up and haul it to, to the plants. And it'll vary. Some of it is like a slurry. Some of it's chunky, mm. but it's not, it is. Uh, so once it gets to the, the, the plant, it will be separated in a, in a storage area where a, an operator can sort of pick and choose where our lower BTU sections, wetter sections, drier, chunkier portions of it. And that will be fed on a belt that, that goes into the plant. Um, also going in, and this will be important as I described the carbon capture uh, yeah. aspect of the business. We're also putting in crushed limestone and the crushed limestone reacts with the the sulfur in the waste and absorbs it and prevents the sulfur from getting being released into the atmosphere. So oh. that, that is an important part of the process. But now you've got two different belts going into the into the plant. And um you can see it 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 goes up about seven stories and is dumped into this circulating fluidized bed that is you know, it's extremely hot, obviously, and this material is all suspended in these vortices. The uh, the ash that comes as a result of the, the combustion is ultimately fed out of the process. And the the waste coal that is being combusted um, is recirculated um, and Got stays it. in. Um, obviously, we're, we're then heating, you know, using all that heat to, to create steam that turns a generator. The generator is directly, you know, going to both the data center and the the, the power grid. Yeah, like I said, we'll, I'll link to that video, Greg, and that that was a, a great walkthrough. Um, 
and and we'll link to the visual in case people are, are more you know visual with it but it's uh it's i'll probably bug you like after the show i'd love to get out if if tours or something you guys do um so i'll probably i'll probably bug you about that after the fact but please you're welcome to come and check it out okay it is, yeah it's that, amazing uh, these things, it's remote. Incredible. We're like one of our sites is an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh, you know, on 700 acres, um, you know, mostly wooded um, at the end of a peninsula surrounded by the Allegheny River. It's a, it's a neat spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So to, to kind of back out from that, you guys start with that as like the base for your operation. And then you guys bolted on Bitcoin mining to, to the operation. Talk to me about how that was that a difficult process? I would imagine what you guys are doing is the hard part already. And you know, you just bolt on Bitcoin mining. Yeah. So hey, these these plants are now 30 years old. So we've refurbished them. And it, it took CapEx to do that. Um, part of what was attractive about them is that PGM is is not a great power market. I think it's becoming a better power market. Um, but it's, you know, if you look nationwide, hey, where's the cheapest power? Um, hey, there are many seasons where pretty, you know, really cheap power has been available in PJM. So from our vantage point, if you can run the plants efficiently enough to make power for, you know, forty dollars a megawatt or four cents, that that's an attractive to the Bitcoin mining community. It's a great price. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you have to, if the plant isn't running, can you buy power for a, a similarly low price? Um, and you can you can buy power uh, for probably four to six cents um, if you can't make it if you're making it at four. So it's you still have quite a bit of margin um, for for mining at least pre having for sure, and we'll see what happens post having. Um, yeah. But yeah, I would say yeah, getting the plants refurbished and running base load. Hey, that's been that's been tougher than we expected for sure. But I think you, you can look every quarter. The plants are becoming more efficient and the costs are coming down, uptime's going up. And so we're, you know, we're getting there. Um, but hey, the plants had, we now have two of these plants. And before we bought them, they spent five years really running only a few months a year. So it, it has hmm. been a project to get them back to sort of the baseload spec that you need to make it worthwhile. Um, building out the data centers, hey, that was, that was expensive. Um, but Hey, we've, you know, we've done it. So that, those, those costs are now behind us. Yeah. Um, running the data centers, we, we actually partner with a firm called frontier mining. Arlen Whitfield oh. runs that, that business. You may know, yeah, Arlen. Yeah. he'd be good on your I, show. I know Kyle Heron. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I know Kyle, but he, I'm sure he's one of the frontier guys if you're mentioning yeah. him now, but, uh, yeah. and they've done a, you know, they've, they started with us just within the past couple of months and they've done a great job. But we, we attempted to, to manage the data centers ourselves. Um, and just found that it's, it's a, that's a business that I think we'll, we'll have better margins if we outsource it to, to Arlen's group. And that that's been great so far. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate you, you bringing that up because I mean, operating the the facility, the the power plant itself is, you know, when you look at both of the businesses, that's that's why I was curious, you know, how how it was to kind of bolt on the the Bitcoin mining component too, because it's very different and and very different, you know, needs in the staffing, very different needs in you know what you're paying attention to, things like that. So, I'm I'm glad things are going well with Frontier. That's it's good. Yeah, no, but you're you're right. We have the the amount of uh you know, we've got a lot of black and blue, a lot of bruisings from the learnings of the past couple of years. Um and but I'm hey, thankfully now we're a costs are coming down, efficiency is going is going up, uptime is going up. So we're I think we're on the right side of the the curve. But no, I think Bitcoin mining in your garage, sort of easy. Plug a machine in. But if you're running forty thousand machines, um and you're, you know, sometimes we'll have multiple times a day where we are um, shutting the data center down and diverting the power to the grid. Um, or like to actually today, Panther Creek has been has been off and it's it's restarting today. So it's just a, 
it becomes a lot more complicated when you're running these data centers in in scale in conjunction with uh, an old power plant. But yeah. hey, we're we're I think we're we're there where with the sort of the initial promise of stronghold is finally now being realized. Yeah. What if if you don't mind me asking what w- during the process of you know kind of getting them back up the the power plants back up to being able to run at like a base load or or more consistently than you know like you said a couple hours really in a year what like what would you say was the most shocking or or maybe just like something that was like huh I didn't think that that would require that much time and attention to to get this this old beast back and running. Yeah, so it's really, you, there are so many different systems. Like you'll have an ash handling system. You'll have a coal feeding system. You have limestone crushers, coal crushers, ash handlers. Um, you've got like the the uh, the bus bar that, that's where the electricity leaves the plant. But it's really in any one of those systems. Um, like originally, they all had redundancy. So you had two coal crushers, two limestone crushers, multiple you know, ways to have the same output. Uh, But over the decades, the, you know, one system was cannibalized to, to make the other system work. So you didn't have the redundancy. So it it was, it was a lot of time and effort and capital to get the redundancy on the systems to make it all go, Um, which was, was some new equipment, you know, some, you know, I'd say, Hey, now we struggle with, Hey, why did why did we trip offline? And it turns out we have the plant has. If you were when you come visit, you'll see there are very few people in the plant. Mm. It, there's a sophisticated control center that has you know we, we have sensors and pressure valves and equipment measuring equipment all over every aspect of the business and all these systems. Um, but if the sensor is, isn't working, then you're not getting the protection that you expected to have. So it's just really going through gotcha. you know every detail um that that could potentially take you offline and you know i think we're we're now coming offline less than we were in the past but we still have we're still not quite done with understanding every aspect of of what you know might potentially happen um until it until something fails so yeah. um but it's 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 really just going through every system uh and getting the double double redundancy back in place sure yeah and i i i appreciate that cuz i yeah, i i can't even imagine the the level of intricacy of of how all those systems work i mean it's there it's, there's so much that yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. and and I, I would like just give me a chance to recognize, hey, those that work at the plants, um, and many of them work in outside. And Pennsylvania is not, you know, Southern California. It has has yeah. reasonable summers but cold winters. Um, it's if you're working inside in in an, an industrial place, hey, they're they're big moving parts, so they have to be trained and careful. Um, but like the engineering talent to understand and you know, and operate and ultimately fix and maintain the systems. These are talented guys that, that it, where it's a specialty. Um, so, hey, many are working in, you know, sort of a remote part of Pennsylvania, but it's, it's really pretty amazing engineering, you know, electrical engineering talent, mechanical engineering talent, um, which is, uh, you know, it's not, I guess it's not surprising, but it's, it's, it's a nice thing to see. Um, and I'm thankful that we have the the talent available to take care of these things and make them run. Yeah, I I completely understand what you mean. I, I have had a chance to visit a couple of I got a chance to visit an old retired. I think it was coal. They were in the middle of converting it to a natural gas plant. So I I've gotten to see this infrastructure in person and it's something that is so removed from today's world. You know, people, you've got your, your face in your iPhone 15. Now it's people aren't, aren't really exposed to the, you know, the, the special trade of maintaining and, and operating one of these plants and let alone under, even understand what they are anymore. Um, so Greg, I want to kind of 
maybe pivot the conversation a little bit, you know, kind of future looking now. I would love yeah. to hear I would love to hear, you know, what is kind of like the immediate future trajectory? What are you guys kind of gearing up to do? We've got, you know, not only are you operating the power plant, but we also have the having coming up, which yeah. you guys I think are positioned really, really nicely given, you know, the cost of your inputs, which equals the cost of your electricity. But I'd love to hear kind of a near term trajectory. What are you guys working on? Yeah, I mean that, that makes but you make a great point. From our vantage point, the best thing you can do to preserve your business through the having is to drive your power costs as low as you can. That's even more important than increasing the efficiency of your opera of your miner. So if you looked at hey, do you care more about having more efficient fleet or having an ever a, a super low cost of power? A low cost of power will give you a better gross margin than re uh is re-replacing your fleet with more with better efficiency machines. That said, so we've been focusing on driving our driving our cost of power down, and I think that's coming out like quarter after quarter, month after month. We're showing that we're able to do that. We are also uh, obviously considering constantly should we update uh, portions of our fleet. So hey, we're running forty thousand miners, and yep. we're focused additionally on replacing you know making sure that every one of those of our slots is full. And, you know, as our miners age, um, we will pull the aged ones out and not try to repair them and replace it with a more efficient machine. So that's the, um, that's also a, what's driving us. And then we have one other um, business line that we're now in the process of, of building and that's carbon capture. And oh, so cool. I think if you looked at us, and I'll go in detail on that, but we have the, you know, the revenue from mining Bitcoin. We have the potential revenue from selling power and renewable energy credits, which are act, are, which our reclamation activities allow us to earn. And we'll have a third revenue line now from from creating carbon credits. And that's a result of the ash that comes out of this process. Yeah. Is um is able to absorb carbon um, like a sponge, like 12% by weight. So I think we make, um, you know, for every 100 pounds of ash that comes out of the plant, we can capture 12 pounds of carbon dioxide. And that's just a result of the chemistry of the ash and okay. really a result of the, the limestone that we put in the in the plant to take the sulfur out that it's that makes the ash have properties that allow it to absorb carbon dioxide. So we are, you know, our current process is the ash comes out of the plant. Mm -hmm. We load it in a truck and take it and haul it back to where the waste came from. And that, that helps to, uh, to helps reduce the acidity of these sites where the, the waste comes from. And okay. so the change in our process is that we're now going to take the ash allow it to get exposure to a lot of airflow. Um, so we're going we're gonna to spread it out among um, a bunch of corrugated pipes, essentially. And those pipes are going to be uh, hooked up to a, what looks like it's essentially a giant air handler, but it's okay. using, you know, sort of, uh, you know, natural airflow mechanics rather than fans to drive airflow through that, those pipes and through the ash. And that's going to allow that ash to bond with the carbon dioxide in the air. And once it does that, that then we'll gather the ash back up again and, and haul it back to the sites where the waste came from. Um, but the value wow. of that, that, that change in process should allow us to earn uh, 45Q credits or sorry, 45Q treatment from the, the government under the IRA. Um, I mean, that's that's not a sure thing, but we believe that's the intent of the of the law should make us be able to earn it. And then we believe that we'll be able to earn voluntary carbon credits that should be tradable and saleable as a part of the activity. And we're working on that that process as well. That's incredible. I do you guys have a like a robust R and D team? How would you even stumble into an idea like that? I mean that that's incredible. <laughs> uh, you know what? Yeah. It's um. 
the the ash is a byproduct of the process. So we we've we've studied it extensively because we think it should be a um a product used in like green cement or you know that's a um there's a material that that should be useful to <coughs> to um sorry that's to cool. um potential buyers. So in the process of setting the ash, really you learn its chemical chemical composition. And so, you know, we know a lot about it. And it's really the IRA, which I'll I'll credit, you know, credit the IRA for forcing us to to study further. Well, hey, can we use the ash to capture carbon? Um, And, uh, you know, it's it's essentially calcium oxide as a, you know, you could Google this, that that is a sponge for carbon dioxide. And and what you get a result is calcium carbonate. So it's it's really the process of setting our ash plus the IRA and the economic benefits of that and the creation of a, of the voluntary carbon market that led us to, to figure it out. But we have, uh, we have partners at a firm called Carbonetic that's out in California that if, if you're to go visit their lab, you would say, Hey, you know, you're in the right place because they have literally a warehouse that has shelf after shelf, like row after row of ash from every kind of industrial facility that makes ash, you know, oh, like wow. around the world, and yeah. they're studying it to figure out, hey, what's the highest and best use for that product? Um, and you know, we we are we are applying to the uh, Nasdaq re- owned registry called Puro that um, that will allow us to, you know, once once we qualify, which you hope to by the end of the first quarter, should allow us to begin selling these these credits. Um, but it's still early days. But hey, the yeah. The lab testing has not conf- been confirmed by field testing, and so we're you know we're now b- beginning the the more industrial scale build out phase of that that process. Yeah, carbon capture is it's it's very there's a lot of work behind it right now. From what I understand, I don't know a ton about it, but from what I know, there's there's a lot of work being done to better understand how to measure it. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's, that's incredible. Um, I said it at the very top of the episode, Greg, I I mean, it's like this full cycle, you know, operation that you guys have with Bitcoin mining bolted on, which is just, you know, it's the icing on the cake as far as everything you guys are doing. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, so when you kind of continue to look forward into the future, do you, could you give us like a, maybe a two, five, 10 year roadmap, um, keep it as high level as you want, or, or, you know, like with the, the carbon capture, go as deep into it as you want, but would love to yeah, just kind of so, hear. Yeah. Hey, my, my hope is on carbon capture is that we prove it out for the rest of the, 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 the other reclamation sites that are, are running. We really ought to, you know, uh, make sure that, that as a like society and as an industry, that we capture as much carbon as we can and don't waste that opportunity. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get our site like up and running fully, which we would hope to, you know, make real progress on that in 2024. So this is not a, a five year dream. It's, you know, thankfully just the, yeah. the existing infrastructure of the plants, which would cost like each, like a quarter of a billion dollars each to build. That's really the secret sauce. Like others that are doing direct air capture, they're having to go build billion dollar facilities. But I think the secret of our process is that we already have this existing asset that's that's creating this beneficial use ash that also captures carbon. So um like near term, like meaning 2024, hey, we we want to really show through the having that we have something better than what the average miner would have in terms of of the ability to generate margin in what could become a tough market again. Um, yeah. And hopefully Bitcoin price increases enough to make it, uh, to offset the, the reduction in Bitcoin mining rewards. Um, hey, but if it doesn't, it'll be, it's a, it's even more important to have, to have other options. Uh, and, and Stronghold is unique in that category among miners. Um, I still think, hey, we're, we're, um, Still, you know, we're we're gonna we're around for exahash, um, which is subscale for a public company. So I think, hey, we'll either 
you know, my I would predict, hey, we're, we're either um, going to be, you know, merging with others or buying others or be bought ourselves. I, but I, I don't think, I think, I think with the having coming up and with many others focused more on vertical integration, um, hey, I think we could be an attractive uh, buyer for businesses or we could be an attractive guy to merge with. But uh, I think we should see consolidation across the industry that the having should just make even more important to focus on. Um, but I'm, I say that, but I, hey, most miners are so enthusiastic about the potential performance of Bitcoin that they kind of want to ride it out alone. So, you know, so far I've been wrong about that, but maybe the having will, will spur some, some interest in that, in that area. I think so. I, I think it's going to force a lot of either creative thinking or a lot of M and A activity. Um, I, it's just the, the compression on revenue and then the, the price appreciation in Bitcoin that we're going to have to see for, for some folks out there is there's, there's a lot of unknown with it. And then you look to the next having, okay, so, you know, we got this one coming. Sure. Yeah. But look at the next one. Um, that's the one where it starts to get like, Oh, Oh boy. <laughs> Yeah, you ha- you you then you then need to rely on Bitcoin being a lot more expensive to make the hash price work out. So hey, we're um, hey, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a believer in Bitcoin and its utility. Um, but I think as and it may be strange to hear from a, a guy that's doing crypto and Bitcoin mining space. I think we're trying to do it in a in a more risk averse way which really yeah. means drive your cost of power as low as you can. And so if you want to think about carbon capture another way, all of the revenue from carbon capture, if applied to power pricing, would drive us down to something like, you know, below around $8,000 per coin mined as a cost. And I think that's, you know, if we're able to do that, which I know it's a big if because we still have to execute on the carbon capture aspect of it. Um, but that would make us the the lowest cost miner of the publics. Yeah. Plus unique uh, additional streams of revenue spinning off of the the business as well. Yeah, it's yeah. it's super exciting, Greg. I uh, for a lot of reasons have been a big admirer of Stronghold and everything you guys are doing, and this has been a lot of fun for me to to go deeper to ask some of these questions. Um, and and here, you know, I mean, you're just so well thought out, too. So it's it, this has been a lot of fun for me, and I I really appreciate the time that you've given. So just to to keep a tab on the time, it's you've been gracious with with how much you've given. Um, would love for you to just kind of point the audience to, you know, I don't know if you want them to get in touch with you directly, but you know, stronghold at large. How can the audience find out more? Um, and we'll of course we'll link to everything in the show notes. But yeah, you know what, our website. Uh, strongholddigitalmining.com has a lot of links to to get into more detail on what I'm des- what I've described on your on your show here. Um, that's probably the best way to learn more about the company. I'm I'm on LinkedIn, so hey, I'm happy to uh, to interact uh, in that platform as well. Awesome. Uh, we'll we'll link to that. Uh, all of that. And then I'll actually link separately to you guys' YouTube video, just that, that also gives the visual for, for how the electricity is generated. Cause it's, it's, it's really cool to see it too. Um, Greg, this has been fantastic. Again, thank you for the time and going deep on, on all of this. Uh, it's really exciting to see what you guys are working on and you take care. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for talking. Thanks for having me on.